We're live. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Matt Foley. I'm the program director uh, at Invest Nebraska and help lead our Combine Incubator. If you're not familiar with the Combine Incubator, uh, like it was started in 2019 to help early stage ag tech companies. And a little bit more background about Invest Nebraska. Invest Nebraska is a venture development fund. We support early stage startups across Nebraska. Programs like such in partnership with LUTs, our statewide sponsor, the Combine Incubator, are recorded and sent to entrepreneurs across the state of Nebraska to help with various aspects of their business. Today, we are fortunate to have Lauren Harris and her team talk a little bit about accounting basics, getting set up in QuickBooks. Um, and I will hand it over to Lauren, I'll make you host. Um, and like I said, we'll have some live participants as well as this will be recorded and sent out to some of the companies we work with in the incubator as well as across the state. Um, when you are a host, you might get the occasional attendee hopping in. So that might just be something to keep an eye on. Okay. Thank you. All right. You should be host. And thank you again for doing this. I, I can't say enough about LUTS. LUTS has been a huge help to a number of companies in Nebraska's portfolio, as well as to several combine incubator companies. Um, so we're really fortunate to have you guys here today. Yeah, we're we're happy to participate and we're looking forward to the partnership. The time I was like, oh, what, what, are we, what are we gonna say next, Mike? Oh, I just like cool. And Mr. Okay. Starry, you might have to mute yourself there, sir. <laughs> Bob, we did your <laughs> that was good. All right, I'm going to share here. Well shoot, we could probably take like a full half of this whiteboard, trace it, and put our story, like a story map on it. Okay. If we want. Because, like, we don't need any of this money, right? No. All this Lauren, table. Lauren, you could also mute him if need be. Okay, yeah, let me do that quick. I think we could do. Yeah, we could do I don't know, I guess how in depth would we want to do it like down to the ticket level or just the big picture story map stuff? <laughs> okay, we're probably good there. All righty, can you guys see the slideshow then? Yes, looks perfect. Perfect. So to start, I'm Lauren Harris. I have worked at LUTS for about five years. I'm a manager in our client accounting services division, which handles all aspects of small business accounting. Um, and consulting. And just a little bit about LUTs. We are a business solutions firm. So while Zach and I are here today, we're from our accounting division. We also have four other divisions, which you can see here on this first slide. We have accounting, financial, tech, mergers and acquisitions, and talent. So we offer a variety of services outside of accounting for our clients. So I'm going to be talking about accounting software basics, mainly QuickBooks, and then just some general setup type items that are important for, for uh, you guys to know. So do you want to introduce yourself to start? Yeah, um, I'll introduce myself as well as Lauren mentioned. My name is Zach. Um, now I've been, I'm a tax manager here at LUTS, work primarily in the tax department. Um, I've been here five plus years. Um, I specialize in construction and real estate, um, but like Lauren said, um, we specialize in helping businesses file their taxes with compliance, helping out with um, strategic analysis, um, 401ks, all of those matters. So if you have any questions along the way, please feel free to email me. I think Lauren and I have our email um, addresses up there on the slide. So feel free to email us with any questions if you think of something after this presentation. So software overview. So what an accounting software's primary function is, any accounting software that you were to use, this is gonna be primarily what you should get out of your accounting software. You should be able to summarize your financial data, typically always in an electronic format. Um, paper ledgers are a thing of the past, hopefully. <laughs> um, you should be able to generate reports that help you with various forms of analysis on your business. Um, budgeting and forecasting and tax reporting. So you should be able to get some sort of 
trial balance or financial statement that will help with compliance reporting. It should provide easy access to historical data as well. Um, for if you ever need to, I don't know, if you're audited and need to go back and look at prior years, you should be able to get transactional data related to past periods. It helps you maintain customer and vendor list information. And then you also have the ability in most cases to print computer checks to eliminate some of that paper touching. QuickBooks is the most common accounting software that our client base utilizes. And in QuickBooks, you have the ability to do everything on the previous slide. And um, what it's really good for, what they advertise as an accounting software is ease, ease of tracking income and expenses. It's really easy to do data entry and um, transactional uh, entry in there. You can create invoices and statements for your customers. And now there's options to electronically deliver that through QuickBooks. You can or organize all of your financial data in one place. So QuickBooks is just a single software. It has many different modules, but it's all in one type software that you can access just with one login. You can easily sync with your bank accounts and credit card accounts to reduce data entry errors and also just increase efficiency. Both versions of QuickBooks allow you to automatically link your bank accounts and credit cards um, into the software so that you can uh, increase your efficiency, efficiency with your data entry and like it says here, reduce errors because all the information is coming directly from the bank. You're not having to hand key anything in. And then you can also generate reports, financial reports to analyze your business that go outside of just your typical financial statements. There's reports specific to accounts receivable, accounts payable, sales, all types of customized reports in there that you can get with just a basic QuickBooks subscription. Lost my mouse, there we go. So the basic features of QuickBooks, so with any standard type subscription, this is the different modules that you're going to get out of that software. You're going to have ability to add and edit a chart of accounts that you can customize yourself. They also have um, industry chart of accounts that you can start with and add to. You're going to have a customer module and a vendor module for um, maintaining those lists. And then also if you're using accounts receivable or accounts payable as part of your business, you're going to have check writing, bill pay and credit cards. So kind of your payments module is all kind of together. There's a specific place to track all of those bank outflows. And then on the other side of that deposits and um, customer payments to track your bank inflows. Budgeting, there's a, there's a module for creating budgets and comparing to actual. There's, as, it, as I talked about on the last slide, reports, standard reports, ability to customize reports outside of just basic financial statements, and then 1099 tracking as well. There's, there's a, the ability to set certain vendors as contractors and then kind of create and send 1099s directly through the software, or at least have the ability to print them out so you're not hand keying that. These are all of the current um, and most up-to-date product offerings for QuickBooks. If it's a software that you're considering, you have a few different options. QuickBooks Online is by far the most common in today's day and age. There's only a couple reasons why someone maybe wouldn't want to go to QuickBooks Online, and it's for complex sort of accounting instances like if you're trying to track inventory or do any sort of job costing in like a construction world. Um, but other than that, QuickBooks Online is definitely um, very user friendly and there's not 
really a reason why you couldn't use that software if it's the way you want it to go. There's QuickBooks Desktop has just regular desktop, which has Pro and Premiere. There's also a Mac version. Um, and then Enterprise, which is just the most robust type of QuickBooks desktop, that's going to have some of those things that we talked about with why you wouldn't want to go to QuickBooks Online. If you have those, that might be a reason why you would choose Enterprise because it, it houses some of those more robust functions, whereas the Pro and Premiere is going to be a pretty basic version of the software. Um, the main difference is QuickBooks Online is cloud-based. It can be accessed from any web browser. Um, depending on the subscription level you have, you can have a certain number of users, but anyone can access it you know, from anywhere, anytime. You can have multiple users in there at the same time. And then there's also the ability to grant account access. So if we were doing helping you do your taxes, you can grant us access to your QuickBooks at no additional cost. With the desktop version, it is a software application that you download and keep on your computer. So you have to have a way to store it. There's caps on the number of users you can have depending on the version. And you can't always have more than one person logged into it at the, at the same time. There's also the ability to run payroll for an additional cost in online and desktop. There's different subscription levels based on how complicated your payroll is and the different benefits and types of things that you're offering through there. Um, but those are the options you have there to add that on. Maintenance, um, this is going to be maintenance related to both types of QuickBooks. So on online and desktop, these are things that you want to consider when it comes to just general software maintenance setting up users and passwords, um, depending on the subscription level that you have or are using, as mentioned on the previous slide, there's a certain number of users that you can set up, but you're gonna wanna make sure that if you have multiple people using the software, that each person has a separate user. Um, QuickBooks does a, an automatic audit trail, so that will allow you to see who's doing what and who's logging in and all that type of stuff. And if you have different users set up, you're, you're able to control access to the different modules. Each user, you can, if you don't want them to have bank access or um, payment access, you can kind of shut that off depending on what their job description is and what they're supposed to be in there doing. And then setting closing passwords is important once the tax return is completed for a year and you're done, you want to set a closing password, which just allows you to close out a year and shut it down so that there's no more changes, that QuickBooks will kind of shut off the ability to make changes to a prior tax period so that we're not missing anything on the tax side. Sorry, I'm trying to. And that is all I had on QuickBooks. I don't know, Matt, if you want to do questions now or wait until that's yeah. done and kind of do them all together or. Yeah, let's do this. I think there's there's a couple of questions that were submitted ahead of time from entrepreneurs that might be relevant. And we can open it up to questions for the group and then we can move on. So let's maybe block off eight to 10 minutes for now. So one of the questions, um, and you kind of closed with it is, you talked about the closing process, which brings to the question, how do you recommend small businesses, the companies we're often working with, best engage groups like yourself? Maybe they're doing the bookkeeping, but when it comes to preparing for tax, um, obviously you can, like you mentioned, add access to an accounting team. What's some of the best pro or pra practices you recommend for this? Definitely. Um, so most of our clients that if we're doing the tax return and maybe they're doing the bookkeeping throughout the year and reconciling throughout the year, they may just hire, <clears throat> excuse me, hire LUTs to do two things at year end to help them close out the year. The first one is a cleanup on the books to get the book balances accurate. And that might be stuff like maybe the bank reconciliations haven't been done for the whole year. So we're handling that piece of it to make sure everything's been entered and there's nothing duplicated, that type of thing. Or they've recorded loan payments, but maybe the interest piece is missing. So we're just taking a quick look through 
making sure that they've captured all the deductions they're entitled to and getting everything recorded properly in the books so that we can hand it off to the tax department and everything's kind of ready to go for them to prepare the, the tax return. So what we call that is like a, I don't know, like a year end cleanup or an, an annual project. That is probably the majority of what our department does related to the year end close process. We also have clients who prefer to do that more frequently. Um, so they may, you know, depending on the level of person they have doing the bookkeeping, or sometimes it's just the owner handling it on their own, they may hire us to do a piece or part of that process throughout the year so that it's not as cumbersome at the end of the year. Uh, that's helpful. Thank you. And another question we, we've gotten a, a number of times is regarding the chart of accounts. So sometimes maybe it's unique, uh, a tech business or a software business, and they, they come into kind of the default QuickBooks online and they feel like, well, some of the chart of the accounts that I'm starting with don't feel right. How do I know which ones to create, potentially remove? Um, do you have any advice for resources or best practices for setting up that chart of the account for the first time? Um, we, I mean, a lot of times we do recommend at least starting with what comes out of the industry chart from QuickBooks, and then you can edit it or customize it to what you feel is right for your business and, and the different service lines that you're offering, because every business is going to be a little bit different how they do that um, but as far as what we have at LUTs we we would have standard chart of accounts for specific industries a lot of times like the medical industry publish that annually so we would have resources in that field I would have to check to see if we have anything that is tech specific um, that we've provided to people in the past but I can do that otherwise groups like this I mean when you have a conglomerate that's all kind of in the same tight knit group, it's a lot of times we see people in these types of groups sharing that type of information just to create ideas amongst each other and make sure one, you know, one person's not missing something or just kind of. Any, other, que any other questions from the live group for the QuickBooks portion of the presentation? I guess kind of the final question I had is what's kind of a common, is there a common error, common mistake that you see early stage companies getting themselves into when they're just getting up and running? Yeah, I, I would say the most important thing to establish right away is a schedule or a process for <clears throat> handling your accounting. And what I mean by that is a lot of times we see some of these startups are smaller, closely held businesses. They don't really have a bookkeeper on staff to begin with. So maybe the owner is gonna handle it for a year or they're gonna have an office manager or receptionist that kind of handles it for a period of time. And I think what happens then is if you don't set a schedule of every week, you're gonna look at, look at the transactions and code them or every month, you get really behind and then you're trying to pull financials for the bank to renew a line of credit and you don't have anything out there. So it's a scramble to get it caught up. So definitely something not to put on a back burner is just kind of create a habit of making sure you're coding your transactions at a minimum, just what's coming through your bank and credit card on a monthly basis to make sure you at least have something out there in the event you need to pull reports. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you, Lauren. Yeah, I'd say we can go ahead and proceed with the next section. Okay, like I mentioned earlier, I know some people joined after we started, but uh, my name's Zach and I'm a tax manager here at Lutz. Um, and today we're just going to discuss some of the uh, um, common tax business structures. Really kind of our goals, our agendas for today. Um, we're going to talk about what are the various types of tax structures out there. Um, you know, the ones you might quite frequently hear of are corporations, partnerships, S corporations. Um, how does each structure affect my personal taxes? So depending on which structure you choose for your business, how is that going to affect the business taxes, your personal taxes, and what are, what are the different consequences? And then we're also going to talk about, there's also advantages and disadvantages for each structure, um, depending on what your goal is and what your objective is with the business. 
So these are probably the four most common business structures we see um, for tax purposes. Um, we have our corporations. Uh, this is probably the most widely known. Uh, these are your Nikes, your Walmarts, um, listed as uh, public exchange companies where you can go out and buy stocks. Um, we have S corporations and partnerships. Um, these entities are a little bit different than corporations, and we'll talk about that here in a little bit. And then we have sole proprietorships. Um, these are businesses that are owned 100% by individuals, um, and their income is reported on their personal tax return. So the first tax business structure we'll talk about corporation. And for a corporation, when the business generates income, that income is taxed at the corporation level. So the corporation itself is the tax paying entity. So if the corporation makes a net profit of $100,000, the corporation is going to be the one paying the tax on that on that profit. Um, currently, right now, as it stands, the, the federal corporate rate is 21%. Um, you may have heard that the infrastructure bill is being passed right now. Um, plans to pay for that. They want to increase the corporate tax rate to 28%. Corporate taxes in the past were 35%, so this is constantly kind of changing. Um, it's always a subject matter to be um, attentive of. And then the corporations also are subject to some state taxes. So we have a federal tax and a state tax. So if the corporation makes $100,000, they're going to be paying $21,000 of tax at the federal level and then 4 to 5% at the state level. Um, one of the big, I guess, components of a corporation is if I'm an owner or a shareholder of a corporation and I have cash inside of that corporation and I want to take the cash out, generally speaking, that's going to be called a dividend. And a dividend is just, I want to take cash out of the company and give it back to myself for being an owner. So that dividend, when it comes out of the corporation, is taxable to the shareholders. We'll talk about how that's a disadvantage here soon. Um, but just want to highlight some of the advantages and disadvantages. And if you have questions along the way, please write them down. Ask me at the end because um, I don't want to miss anything if you guys have any questions. So one of the advantages of a corporation, um, corporations are allowed to have preferred stock. Uh, preferred stock just means there can be different levels of stock. You may, have, you may hear corporations have class A, class B, class C stock. And each level of stock can be treated differently. Uh, one stock can have dividends. The other one... The other class of stock cannot receive a dividend and that's advantageous for some smaller companies because it allows for um, investors to come in um, it's more marketable for investors if i'm an investor and i want to come in and hey you guarantee me my class a stock is going to return me eight percent that might be more marketable than if i come in and you're an s corporation which we'll talk about later where that's not allowed um, the corporate rate also right now is at 21 percent the top individual tax rate is 37%. So that's an advantage right now. If, if you are a corporation, you are going to be paying a lower effective top rate than an individual. And the final um, advantage I wanted to highlight is anyone can own shares in a corporation. There's no limitations. We'll talk about some of the other tax structures later on that are going to have limitations on who can own shares. Corporation, anybody can own the shares. Now, some of the disadvantages, like I mentioned earlier, there's this concept called double taxation. If the corporation makes income or $100,000, they're going to pay tax on that $100,000. Now, if the shareholders want to take that $100,000 of cash and take it out of the corporation and pay themselves back, that's going to be treated as a dividend and taxed on their personal level as well. So we went through one layer of tax at the corporate level, and now we're going to go through another layer of tax at the individual level. This is what they call double taxation. Um, which is a big disadvantage for corporations. Um, corporations don't qualify for, for qualified business income deduction. This is kind of a new deduction that was um, created a few years ago with the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. We'll talk about it later, but it's only qualified for pastor income and sole proprietors. And then we have um, contribution of property. Anytime, generally speaking, <coughs> contribute or property is going into a corporation and outside of a corporation, that triggers a taxable event. So the next tax structure I'd like to talk about is the S corporation. Now the S corporation um, is nearly identical to the C corporation, although there are a few uh, major differences with the first one being that the business income for an S corporation is taxed at the individual level. Um, and you may 
adhere to this, refer to it as a flow through business. So if the corporation makes $100,000 at the business income level, that income is passed out to the shareholders, where then the shareholders are going to report that $100,000 on their personal tax return. So the corporation does not pay any taxes. That income is passed through to the shareholders, and the shareholders have to pick up $100,000 of income on their personal tax returns. Um, one of the advantages of the corporation is cash distributions to owners are potentially tax free. Now, there's a couple of restrictions, but like we mentioned earlier, if you take cash out of the corporation, it's generally taxed as a dividend, which is taxable to the shareholder. Uh, for the S corporation, that's not necessarily true. Um, you are allowed to take cash distributions out of the corporation and into your own pocket without being taxed. Now, there's a few restrictions um, and a few other laws that we have to follow to do that, but generally speaking, that's the rule. And then they qualify for this concept called qualified business income deduction. This is a 20% deduction for pass-through entities. Um, so if the corporation makes $100,000, they're entitled to a $20,000 qualified business income deduction. Um, and this was generally, uh, I would say it was made up because the corporate tax rate was at 21% and the top individual tax rate was at 37%. So if you kind of mirror those two a little bit closer together, um, Congress passed this 20% business income deduction for individuals just to get them relief. So an individual like Lauren and I, if we're in the top rate, we would be paying 37%, whereas a company like Walmart or Nike, who's making billions of dollars, would be paying 21%. That's just generally not fair, so they created that business income deduction. Um, one of the advantages, or some of the advantages of the S Corporation, like we've talked about, single layer of taxation, income's picked up by the individual on his or her tax return and not by the corporation the tax-free distributions and also since the since this business income is flowing through to the individual's tax return if there is a loss at the at business entity level if there's a fifty thousand dollar loss that loss is passed through to the individual so if i have fifty thousand dollars of of other income on my personal tax return this loss can offset that other income and i can pay zero dollars of tax on my person personal return so there's an advantage um, to that some of the disadvantages like we mentioned earlier, preferred stocks disallowed. Um, and S corporation, you can only have one class of stock. You can't have class A, B, C, D, E shareholders. Um, if, if one person gets a distribution, everybody has to receive a distribution via their um, allocation or their ownership percentage. Um, shareholders must be individuals. Corporations and partnerships cannot be shareholders of an S corporation. It has to be a US individual. Um, like we mentioned earlier, contribution of property inside and outside of the corporation is generally going to create a taxable event. Um, and then in a corporation, we have self-employment tax on the wages. We'll talk about a partnership and sole, sole proprietorship later on. But for an S corporation, um, you don't pay self-employment taxes on the pass-through income. And self-employment taxes are the Social Security and the Medicare tax that most people see through their W-2 wages. Um, so as an S corporation, you don't pay that on the flow-through income, but you have to pay yourself a wage in order to receive that flow through income so that those wages are subject to self-employment taxes. And then the final one is the state tax filings. Um, a lot of times if corporations are, if an S corporation is filing in a lot of states, they pass that income to the individual and now the individual would have to file state taxes in all of those states. So that is that can become compliance and, and costly for individuals. All right, the next business structure we'll talk about is a partnership. This is the same concept as the S corporation where the business income is taxed at the individual level and not the business level, the flow through concept. The same um, treatment for cash distributions to owners. Generally speaking, it's going to be tax free. There's some various restrictions, but if I want to take cash out of the corporation, it's going to be tax free and I'm qualified and I'm so I can qualify for that 20% qualified business income deduction. Now, one of the advantages of the partnership is partnerships are allowed to contribute property and take out property from a, from a partnership tax-free. That does not trigger a taxable event. Um, there's now, there's a few exceptions. Congress always makes a few exceptions, but um, generally speaking, you can put property in and take it out tax-free, unlike the corporation. Um, so in a partnership, any sort of income that the partnership generates and passes through the partners are subject to self-employment taxes on that pass-through income. Now, remember, with the S corporation, you're not subject to the self-employment taxes, the 15% on that ordinary income, but you have to pay yourself the W-2 wages. In a partnership, 
you're subject to self-employment taxes on all the money that's passed through to you. But if you're passed through, if you have a business loss, you don't owe any self-employment taxes. So um, that's one of the advantages. Another advantage of a partnership is income and distribution allocations can be made up however they want. Um, there's a certain set of rules that you kind of have to follow, but generally speaking, if, if I bring cash to a partnership and my other partner brings services or no cash, I can take out distributions and my partner doesn't get any distributions until the business really starts making money. You can kind of make those income and distribution allocations however you want in a partnership. That's not the case with corporations and S corporations. You're not allowed to do that. Um, and then there's no ownership restrictions for partnerships. Now, some of the disadvantages of partnerships, self-employment tax on profits. If, if the partnership makes $100,000, you're going to have to pay self-employment tax on that, on that $100,000. Um, partnerships are, can be very complex. Um, partnership agreements are very hard to read. There's a lot of legal costs sometimes to setting up these partnerships and uh, maintaining the um, complexity. And then the state tax filings, the same as the S corporation. Anytime a business is pushing off income to us in multiple states, we as partners have to go file in those states. So that can be very disadvantageous. And then the final one is the sole proprietorship. Um, this is business income that is taxed on the personal tax return. Now there is no business tax return associated with the sole proprietorship. I myself, I own 100% of the business um, and I'm not incorporated. I'm not a corporation. I don't make it, I'm not an S corporation. I can report this on my schedule C on the 1040. Um, you know, if I had a lawn mowing business and I made some money with the lawn mowing, I would just report it on my Schedule C. Um, this is also entitled to a 20% business income deduction. Some of the advantages of the sole proprietorship, it's very simple and reduced compliance costs. If I just want to start a lawn mowing business, all I, I don't really have to do anything. I just report the income and expenses on my tax return, generally speaking, and I'm good. Um, another advantage is you have 100% control of your business. If you're a sole proprietor, you own the business. You can do you can run the business however you want. And then th there's another advantage with the self-employment taxes. You're going to pay self-employment taxes on your profits, but if you have a loss, you don't owe self-employment taxes. Some of the disadvantages, um, like I said, the self-employment taxes on profits, um, some of your capital funding can be limited. Since you yourself are 100% the owner, um, if you need to contribute cash or kick in cash to the company, it's on you. If you want to bring in a partner, you just created a partnership. You're no longer a sole proprietor. Um, and there's some other liability concerns with sole proprietors um, in regards to personal assets. You kind of get away from that corporate shield of liability. Um, and I'm not a liability expert, but if you, if the corporation shield kind of protects some of the owners and investors from their personal assets. But if you're a sole proprietor, um, there's, a, you know, there's a potential that personal assets could come into play. Okay, and I just want to touch base, probably most of you have heard of um, a lot of companies, probably the most commonly referred to company out there is a LLC, limited liability company. Um, now, a limited liability company can be a sole proprietor. One person owns 100% of the business. It can be a corporation. It can be an S corporation or a partnership. So it's kind of the jack of all trades um, in regards to how you want to be taxed as an LLC. By default, it's taxed as a partnership, uh, but there you can elect to be taxed as a corporation or an S corporation, or if you're 100% owner just yourself, your tax on your individual tax return. And some of the advantages of the LLC is personal liability protection. Um, the LLC provides, as its name defines, limited liability. You're only um, liable for some of the, uh, the, the assets that you contribute to the company. It pretty much provides a protection shield against personal assets, you know, regarding some restrictions, but generally speaking, um, there's flexible management structures that there's not as many compliance costs and um, ongoing state fees and everything like that and compared to like a corporation, an incorporated corporation. Um, and then some of the disadvantages, as I said, um, rules can vary by state. LLCs are treated a little differently by state, so um, they, can be, they can be a little complex at times. Okay, and I just added this slide, what's right for me? These are just maybe some items to consider. I'm starting my business, what now um, in regards to tax? Um, we always ask yourself, who's going to own the business? Me, 100%. Am I going to have a couple other partners? Um, am I going to have another corporation invest with me? How is the business going to be funded? Are we going to come with cash to the company? Is one partner going to contribute property and I'm going to contribute cash? Are we just going to contribute services? How are we going to fund the business? 
how are we going to divvy out distributions? Am I going to get all of the distributions because I'm putting in the work and the other partner sitting on the side? Are we going to make it equal? How are we going to how are we going to allocate distributions and also income and losses? And, you know, if I'm coming with all the cash to a partnership, my partner doesn't come with anything. I want to take some of the losses for that benefit, whereas my partner shouldn't have, shouldn't recognize a loss because he didn't come with any cash to the table. So these are just some general questions to ask yourself um, when when thinking about how am I going to set up my business structure. And then last, the tax law is always changing. As you guys hear, it's it's changed probably three or four times in the last three or four years. There's constantly changing. So. Um, staying up to date with what, what's kind of happening in Congress can maybe um, affect your decision as well. Can you change how your business is taxed? You absolutely can. Um, businesses change over time. You may start off as a as a small partnership if you want to convert to a corporation or vice versa. Um, tax law is always changing. Um, so you're not stuck with the one election um, at the beginning of the life of your business. You can change. Um, there's some various tax consequences um, that can get a little complicated with both, but generally speaking, you can change your, your business. And then I'll be willing to take, or I guess Lauren and I will have any other questions you might have generated throughout this presentation, um, but that's kind of uh, my two cents on the tax business structures. Awesome. Thanks, Zach. Um, to kick things off, we have one question submitted through the chat. Is there a benefit to a startup organization? Is there a benefit to a startup organizing as a C Corp prior to receiving outside investment? Um, so definitely relevant to a number of companies that we work with. They're just getting organized. They obviously are meeting with Invest Nebraska, so they're interested in raising outside capital. Um, and maybe the bootstrap version of their legal entity might be different from long term where they think they could go. Yeah. Um, when generating the corporation, yet yeah, one of the advantages is outside investing. Um, investors. Uh, private equity firms do like to come in um, and invest in the corporations. We see that a lot. In regards to if the corporation, generally speaking, when you're starting up a company, you might incur some losses at the beginning uh, just because you have some expenses to kind of get operations flowing. Um, the, oper the, the losses are going to stick inside of the corporation. So the only disadvantage I would say is if you have some other income, W-2 income on the side, this is kind of just a business I'm trying to start up. Um, I have some other income. You can own if that was set up as an LLC partnership. You know those losses would flow through to your personal income, and you could offset some other income. Whereas in the corporation, those losses are just going to stay within the corporation. So that's one of the disadvantages. But I think if your if your ultimate goal is to kind of get the business started, um, and then make it marketable for maybe some outside investors to come in, a corporation is probably a little bit better of the route. Um, just because, like I said, it's gonna it, it's gonna make items easier. If if you're thinking about taking your corporation across state lines, um, and and filing in different states, um, and matters become a little bit more complicated, that all happens inside the corporation. That doesn't matter to you personally. Um, and like we mentioned, it's still 21% of the corporation. If you're willing to keep all the cash inside the business, and you just want to grow this, and you don't want to take any cash out, that corporation is only paying a 21% tax right now. Um, now, if you're at the top individual level, you'd be paying 37% on that tax. So there's another, I would think, advantage to um, starting a C-Corp. Got it. So you, you kind of mentioned it there, but it brings in one of the questions that was submitted ahead of time. Um, so pass through, you talked about the profit that goes through for an owner and a corporation. Um, and I love the optimism, but honestly, a lot of the companies we're working with that are in the early stage um, the recording losses. So for an owner or one of the CEO of a corporation, is there anything that can be passed through personally in those early years where there's a lot of R&D costs um, and they're most likely recording losses? Yeah, so uh, like you said, um, anytime there's a pass through losses, those are going to be flowed through to the owner. Um, I would think um, there, there's there's some basis issues which I don't want to really get too too in depth because there's like I said there's various restrictions you can't there's there's no just set of one rules um, in regards to this these rules there's always exceptions to the exception but um, you know there's different rules but generally speaking yes losses can come out through the partnership pass through two to the owners and they can offset some of their losses um, and I don't know if that's kind of the question you're looking for if you're looking for um, 
R and D costs. I, you know, I don't, R and D costs are subject to change here coming up soon. I mean, if we're thinking kind of ahead here, R and D costs, I think starting in tax year 2022 are going to be required to be capitalized. So we can't take all of those losses, um, expense year one, we'd have to capitalize them, which means put them on the balance sheet, amortize them over time, taking expense over 10 years instead of one year. Um, and so that's what I mentioned, always kind of looking at the tax law and looking ahead of, you know, I might think I have all these losses, but if I have to capitalize my RD expenses and take them over time, that may not be beneficial for me. Got it. Yeah, that's, that's really helpful information. Uh, I would guess for a lot of people on this call, as well as people that watch the recording, um, yeah, they're, they're doing a lot of heavy research and development, whether it's a hardware company, hard tech, as well as software in those early years. Um, any other questions from the live participants before we close out? I guess, Zach, maybe I'll close with the same question as um, kind of common pitfalls you see, common errors um, regarding entity formation and selection for early stage companies. Yeah, I would say um, some of the times, like in that slide I put up about items to consider, um, the funding of the business, if I know that we're talking tech, but you know, if I have a piece of property that I'm trying to put into the business as my capital contribution, um, you know, not thinking clearly of if that goes through the corporation, that can be a taxable event, whereas in the partnership, it's most likely not going to be a taxable event. And by a taxable event, I mean, it's going, I would have to pay tax at the personal level just for contributing property to the company. Um, and then the income and distribution allocations. Remember, if I make an S Corp election and me and my partner are 50 50, we have to share 50 50 in, in the income that we report and in, in the distributions we make. If I'm a partnership, you know, if my partner, you know, if I'm the one who's at risk or I'm doing more work and my partner sitting on the sidelines, I'm the one who's going to want the distributions and I'm going to want the benefits. Whereas, you know, they may get it when they work more. I mean, things along those lines of, you know, if I make a partnership, we can do that. If I do an S Corp election or a corporation, we really can't do that. Um, so those are just some items to consider of, you know, what are our goals? You know, who's doing the funding and, and, and um, how are we going to allocate things to owners? Is everybody going to be equal or is that not the case? I think one of the slides alluded to it as well, but since you mentioned seeking outside capital, if, if you're going to seek outside capital from another corporation or a non-individual, there's limitations on who can be owners in certain types of entities. So like in an S Corp, I think you said it can just be individuals, right? Yep. So if you're going to go, if they're going to seek um, like an equity contribution from like a private equity firm or from, from Invest Nebraska, like an equity contribution rather than a loan to be paid back, like Invest Nebraska can't be an owner in an S Corp just the way the tax law is written. So you might consider a partnership in that situation because non-individuals can own partnerships. Otherwise it has to be, if it is an S Corp, it probably has to be recorded as a loan that has to be paid back, so. Got it, thank you. Well, if there are no other questions from the live group, um, Zach and Lauren, maybe if we could close, if you could go to the contact slide of how people can get in touch with you and with Lutz. Um, and I speak on behalf of the entire Invest Nebraska team, the Combine, and really the, the general startup community for taking time out of your guys' day. Um, we appreciate it. And I will throw it in the chat for our attendees here live, as well as the recorded version for future programs like this and other meetups with the Combine. Check out our meetup link. Um, and please join me in thanking Lauren and Zach. Like I said, we appreciate your time and, and willingness to share the expertise. and. Um, Lutz is a great partner for the combine, so we're very thankful. Yeah, thank you for thank you, thank you for having us.